the mindset that that brought with it still maintain a level of interpersonal harmony that will allow them to overcome some of the stress points of the future better than people that are living around the equator and in other parts of the planet. As far as the coastline and stuff goes, again, the data seems to favor north of 40 as being more stable than below 40 degrees of latitude. And the further north you go up into the 60s, the more that stability is assured. So I'm not looking for I, I, it would surprise me to see vast changes of coastline in a negative sense around uh, those areas that are north of 40. Um, there will be some level of sea alteration, but again, because of the nature of the ob oblate spheroid that is the Earth, much more of the alteration of the sea levels will occur at the equator than will occur at the poles. And in spite of the level of data that we have at the moment, there doesn't appear to be a major crustal shift that is in the near future. It may be beyond 2013, and our data sets just trail off miserably beyond that. But between now and 2013, while there's going to be all kinds of Earth changes and solar activity, we, we don't have any definitive um, uh, data set that we can look at that maintains itself over time for the idea of a large crustal shift. End of statement. Thank you very much. I would like to ask a question that came from a reader who goes into the dating precisely of your data. I think you heard about the discussion about uh, the 21st of December 2012 versus the date proposed by Kaliman, which is the 28th of October 2011. So does yes. your data tell you anything in relation to these two, two dates, knowing that the 2012 date is sort of the, let's say, mainstream date, and then there is this 28 October 2011 date, which is not widely recognized, but being looked at carefully by people like Kaleman and astrologers, and I've also looked at it. Do you have anything about that to say? Uh, yes, question? actually, uh, we actually have two data sets that we maintain. Uh, it's interesting about the two dates. Let's examine the latter date first. December 21, uh, 2012, at 11.11 11 a.m., not p.m., is the uh, uh, alignment that was deliberately created by Pope Gregory under the auspices or under the direction of the powers that be at that time. They took a, a, a German mathematician of some note who assembled a team and then they use texts that uh, theoretically do not exist. This is to say, the many of the Spanish, or excuse me, many of the Mayan books that were said to have been burned, in fact, were not burned, and they were carefully crated up and taken back to the Vatican as part of the payoff for the expeditions and the slicing of the planet between the Spanish and the Portuguese by the popes of that time. Now, when Pope Gregory had the the calendar redone they went to considerable work. That is to say, a team of, uh, my understanding, a team of 15 mathematicians led by this particular German mathematician spent some five months in the reconciliation level alone to get the Greg Gregorian calendar to align specifically with the end of the Mayan calendar on these particular numbers. So they did it from a numerological viewpoint. They wanted the 1111 AM because 11 is the number of mastery. It is one number beyond divinity. And the 1111 combination brings you to 22, which is their number for sainthood or ascension. And then the whole December 12, 2012, if you start looking at the, the numerological values that are inherent within that, you see that it continually points back to the um, broken cross or the uh, swa what's known as the swastika. This swastika has been uh, tainted by the use by uh, uh, Hitler et al., but in fact it's a very meaningful symbol that derives extremely ancient. I mean, even the Jain who go back uh, millions of years found that symbol handed to them in, as opposed to discovering it. And here's what it really means. If you look down on a swastika and the idea of a broken cross, there's, there, it's both the double cross indicating the four-sided pyramid or five-sided counting the bottom, but it also, in this particular instance, represents a, a solar effect. The solar effect can be seen from the sun or from outside the earth, but we can't really see it from here. But there are these four streams 
of activity that go from the um, uh, magnet magnetic field of the Earth up to the Sun. And because of the rotation of both the Sun and the Earth, these streams are not held as continuous straight lines, but in fact bend and twist. Now, they don't really twist like a um, uh, spiral in a candy or something. They just twist at this one particular point, and so from an outside view, they form the swastika. So the swastika is actually encoded in the way in which the 2012 date was worked out, it was encoded as a reference to solar activity that they understand will occur at that time. And the thinking at the time from the Gregorian calendar, Pope Gregory et al., relates entirely to these hidden level um, Mayan books that I believe the Vatican still possesses, which go to great detail according to references I've read about those things that were theoretically burned. These went to some great detail as to the solar stuff that was going to occur. Now, I actually am of the opinion that Kalaman is much more correct than people would give him credence for, but that nonetheless, the actual end date of the calendar is the uh, 2012 date, the end date of the long count. It may not be as meaningful as Kalaman's date, though, because Kalaman is actually working on a, a different view of the conjunction of the calendars, and he's discussing the uh, how do I, uh, the beginning of the end rather than the end of the end, if we want to look at it that way. So his is much more uh, pertinent to us because it is the it is the point at which we would take that step. Now, uh, as I'd re referred to earlier, from a zero zero class civilization into a class one civilization, that will be the opportune moment. That that will be the karyos. The the quality of time will favor humans doing something magnificent in October of 2011 onward, and that the viewpoint from the powers that be is that their particular point of maximum stress, danger, risk, and opportunity is the 2012 date. End of statement. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just to switch gears now a bit towards other questions, although we had said and we are having this always in mind right now in this now moment that um, we cannot measure the unknown with the known. However, we are interested in silver and gold. And so since gold and silver are priced in U.S. dollars at the moment, what is your take on the timing of when these commodities slash currencies, because gold is also currency, are dislocated from the U.S. dollar? And what will be the new reference mechanism, in your opinion, in terms of pricing outside the U.S. itself? So let's say, for instance, in Sweden, we buy gold using Swedish currency, but the price of gold is converted to Swedish kroner in relation to the exchange rate of U.S. dollar and then in relation to the COMEX price per ounce, which is this illusory paper price. So when the U.S. dollar is rejected by all how will gold and silver be priced? That's the first question. And in conjunction with that comes my own second question, which is simply to ask you if you could elaborate a little bit more on how you see silver performing as opposed to gold. End of question. Sure. Uh, sure. This is a very, it makes a lot of sense, and it's something we've been uh, trying to reconcile here, especially in my discussions with George Ure, because he's a very good economist, but he likes numbers, and of course all of his numbers are dollar-based. So let's take the latter question first. After the disconnect, gold and silver will be valued in two separate different ways. Silver, in, in the view that we have, will be uh, basically the daily transaction, weekly transaction currency. Gold, on the other hand, will be what you would use to make a life-altering purchase, such as the purchase of property, whereas silver would be used to make purchases or transactions that would relate to uh, daily needs or weekly needs. Uh, I'm not saying that we'll use silver per se to purchase uh, fuel, but uh, we certainly won't be using gold. Gold will become so uh, largely precious that we will return to the understanding of gold and silver that they used to have at the beginning of the Roman Empire or the beginning of the um, uh, what's known as the seven state uh, period of India. In that period of time, an ounce of gold was uh, was understood to have the ability to purchase uh, ability for a single person to live 
relatively luxurious, that is to say in the time of Rome, an ounce of gold would purchase the acquisition of a house for a year and food for a year, or it might purchase the uh, two slaves for a year and the ability to feed them for a year, whereas silver would be more of a commodity and you might use a bunch of silver to buy uh, uh, ampules of wine for a year, uh, and you'd have those much more silver in circulation. And we're going to get to the point, actually, where there's um, uh, an extreme level of that, and gold will become hardly circul uh, circulated at all and only used for major transactions. Now, we saw some of that in the United States back in the uh, previous uh, Depression in the 30s, where after the uh, bank holidays in the 30s and the collapse of the bond structures here, as we moved into 35, 6, and 7, and that experience of the Depression here, Gold took on a different level of understanding than existed for the federal government. Bearing in mind that gold had been, quote, seized by our federal government here, in reality, less than a, a third was ever handed in, and probably something only closer to 10%. And it had gold coins, had, and even gold nuggets, had a, had a back or, or a black or gray economy value all out of proportion to the, quote, $35 an ounce price set by the government. Now, our government had intended to use gold to get a, uh, inflation started again during an incredibly difficult period of deflation. Deflation kills governments. In, they can always live with inflation, even hyperinflation, but deflation kills governments. And so they're desperately afraid of that. So in our case, the gold was seized in the 30s in the U.S., not for hoarding purposes or anything, but in a, as an attempt to reset its price from the low 20s to the $35 an ounce in order to force a level of inflation. And it was actually far more successful than they'd ever known because gold took on its own level of own life in these back channel operations such that, that uh, individuals could go and buy 2,500 acres of land for four ounces of gold delivered person to person. And it was only perhaps 10 or 15 years later that that transaction was formalized and recorded in a county deed with a particular price on it because no one wanted to acknowledge that they'd been swapping the gold because the whole thing was it was illegal so the timing that we're looking at now in our data shows that over the course of fall the stresses on the dollar are going to become very acute and perhaps sometime before the end of December we may even see the COMEX itself as an institution fail and we will certainly see stresses upon the currencies that may produce a a steep drop in the dollar from its current level in, say, 70 or whatever it is within the basket of currencies, I would not be surprised to see a drop to 60 and then very shortly thereafter take another very large drop down to perhaps 40. And then it may take a long time to go from 40 to 20. And that long time would exist from November of this year until November of 2010. And by the time we reach November of 2010, looking at the data, it seems to suggest that a larger percentage of transactions will be done even in this country outside of the dollar system than will be done within the dollar system. And that is true of all currencies. So by 2010, uh, we may see the dollar so totally rejected that, uh, for instance, the Swedish kroner has to at that point be backed by gold. Uh, simply to exist as a separate currency or backed by forests or uh, harvest of sea creatures or something, some physical commodity, calorie kind of thing. And when that occurs, the global revaluing of the few small ounces of gold that exist relative to, the, to each and every individual will occur. And so we may actually see a form outside of the United States and outside